Well, thank you very much, folks. Uh, really appreciate uh, you making time uh, to join us here today uh, for what I think is a real important discussion uh, about the new revenue environment we're all operating in. Um, Public Performance Partners uh, is grateful uh, for the opportunity to be a sponsor and a participant in the dialogue here today uh, around exploring capacities and opportunities to work together with public partners that serve the taxpayers in different ways. Uh, I'm a, this nonprofit was formed uh, in, in January to assist local governments in the K through 12 space and higher education with collaborative opportunities. Uh, briefly, my background was I was a county treasurer, was in the front end of a lot of your processes in terms of tax collection for many years in the Dayton area, and then went on to uh, uh, be uh, the former governor's director of the Department of Administrative Services. And interestingly, uh, you know, most people wonder what I did to take off the former governor uh, to become the head of the Department of Administrative Services. Um, but I, I really found it to be a, an instructive place to learn about uh, how services are delivered at the state level, at least, uh, and how siloed uh, we were there, uh, and allowed us to uh, start working on some very, I think, important reforms in the areas of procurement reform, uh, construction reform, and IT consolidation that, that really led uh, to the, uh, the concept of, of P3 or public performance pro uh, partners uh, adding value hopefully at the local government and uh, K through 12 and higher education level as well. Um, I would be remiss if I did not uh, single out uh, a gentleman that was really uh, at the forefront of some of those reform uh, initiatives at DAS, and he's in the House today, um, uh, Mr. Rick Hickman, who is now the Executive Director of the uh, Ohio Schools Facilities Commission. Rick, are you still in the back there? Stand up, please. If there is a steely-eyed missile man to claim the uh, Apollo 13 vernacular, uh, at DAS during those years. It was Rick Hickman. He was the assistant director. He was my king of process. He put together the processes that led to all of the reforms uh, that began in those years. Um, he's a wonderful public servant, and, uh, and if you are, Jack, that committed to process, then you should have Rick Hickman tattooed to your back by the end of this session. I want you to get together. Um, but, you know, following presentations and discussions, we'll endeavor to illustrate some service sharing capacities across the public spectrum. Discuss the importance and challenges of constructing a, a workable governance structure and share some shared services success stories. Um, to set the table for this session uh, is Mr. Randy Cole, uh, Controlling Board President and Policy Advisor to the Office of Budget and Management for the State of Ohio, uh, who's graciously agreed to talk about how Revenue realities are creating more public partnerships every day at the state and local level. Now, I can tell you from experience that the controlling board president is a position that strikes fear in the hearts of uh, ill-vetted spending proposals and unprepared administrators. It's also a position from which uh, one has unfettered view of uh, fiscal trends in the state uh, and organizational risk as well. So we thank Mr. Cole for his time today. Uh, formerly, Mr. Cole uh, worked in the private sector for both First Energy and GovTech Solutions. Before answering the call to service in his current role, Mr. Cole served at the, as the Director of Audit Services uh, and Technology for former Auditor of State and current Lieutenant Governor, uh, Mary Taylor. Uh, please join me in welcoming Mr. Randy Cole. Thank you, Hugh. Um, I think the only thing that I'm really concerned about today is some of the language Hugh uses in talking about me. Um, I read a Gongwer quote that he said, I'm at the tip of the spear of the Kasich administration in developing shared service models, and now I hear that I strike fear in the hearts of people. Um, my wife and three kids, I think, would say that I'm a kinder, gentler kind of gut public servant uh, because only the Department of Administrative Services has been referred to as the evil empire. Hugh, 
Keith, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here, as well as the Nord Family Foundation, the Ohio Grant Makers Forum, and the Fordham Institute, uh, and my friends at the ESC of Central Ohio. Uh, I really welcome the opportunity to be here to talk a little bit about the Kasich administration's approach uh, to developing a shared services model in Ohio, uh, and our vision uh, for how government can be more efficient. Um, and it's nice to be here. I think I see a representative at almost every table. I won't make you show hands. Uh, but I think I have met with or talked with someone at about every table in this room about our work. And that's the first thing I would say, is collaboration begets collaboration. And we are not developing what we're doing in a back room someplace and springing it on people. We are in each of our places using a process of collaboration with a recognition that the stakeholders in the field, local government leaders, education leaders, will be left with our legacy, with what we do during the four years or eight years this administration is here and the work of the legislature, our partners there, and I see some of our partners, Senator Lehner, um, who are working with us on government reform and relief in this state and trying to transform and use the current budget climate as an opportunity to significantly change and make more efficient government in Ohio. So, Again, we believe the collaborative process will work and that local government leaders don't, it's not one size fit all, fits all. This is nothing to sneeze at. This is, I, you know, I don't take myself too seriously, but this is important work. We believe that local government leaders understand their business best. So in most cases, we are not creating new mandates, but options and choices for them to follow. We are trying to develop processes that will expedite and become a catalyst for more collaboration in the state, but not, again, a one-size-fits-all fit, model or a mandate that you have to change the way you're doing things. We do believe that public awareness of what's happening, better metrics, working with the auditor's office and others, will drive a public awareness of how things should be done and incent and encourage local government leaders to do the right thing. But I'll tell you, there's a benefit that comes with that. One of our poster children for shared services in this state is the city of Green, Ohio, where the school district and the city share one administration building. That's right, one chambers, that on Monday nights for City Hall and on Tuesdays, the Board of Education. But more importantly than that, it's one parking lot, one, one lawn to mow, one receptionist. They share equipment, facilities, and staff. And just to let you know, the big benefit to that is the school district just passed their levy and the mayor is running unopposed in November because they save almost 15% of their budget through shared service collaborations within the county and with each other. And they're reaching beyond their county's borders with Stark County for pooled health care. So let me try to keep us on schedule because you've got a great panel coming up um, of experts who can talk to you about some real, real world applications and what's happening. First, in House Bill 153, the budget, we have over a dozen reform initiatives um, that I'm not going to address in a lot of detail here, but I will provide to the organizers. I'll provide it to Hugh um, so they can be posted on the website and disseminated with contact, with summaries of what's happening, the actual law changes, where in the Ohio Revised Code you can see links that enable these things to happen, and contact information from any of the departments or agencies of state that are responsible for implementing those changes. And yes, my name's on there a couple times, but every time I appear with the governor, he hands out my email address anyway, so there's no hiding from it. Of those dozen things, we believe first and foremost, we should be reducing mandates that the state has on local governments, not always unfunded, but sometimes only partially funded mandates. So we're trying to create as much mandate relief as we can, provide opportunities for flexibility and efficiency, and then, of course, shared services. So first, when we talk about vision, we believe government can be more efficient alone. Auditor of State Yost talked about asset utilization. He talked about being more efficient on your own. We are trying to provide those tools, things like prevailing wage reform, construction reform, the statewide public notice website that we will make available to you early in the new year at no cost to local governments or schools around the state to reduce the amount of money you have to spend on newspaper advertising. We believe that's a shared service that the state can take a lead on. You will get information about how you get a user ID and a password so that after you publish in the newspaper first, subsequent notices can just be as brief as a few lines, a couple lines that direct people back to the website for a savings around the state of tens of millions of dollars. Again, 
Many of these ideas came from working with the statewide associations and others. That's the other thing I'll say about this process. It wasn't about one budget. It wasn't about, it really was not about headlines to offset, um, talk about the budget cuts and the changes in revenue that were made. It's part of a process we're following, and I can say this here today because Budget Director Keene, yes, last week, met with some of the statewide associations represented here today of local government and schools and told them, we're going to have a mid-biennium budget review. Not a corrections bill the way it's been done before, but a full review of the policies and the implementation of the budget. And he has made a call to arms to say, come back with more ideas. We took the best of what you offered us before. We vetted it through the administration and put it into the budget. We're ready for round two. And so I say to all of you here, work with your statewide associations, work with your members of the legislature, and bring us more ideas for reform in ways you believe you are constrained in your efforts to collaborate and become more efficient, and we will work with them as soon as this spring when we work on the mid-biennium review. So first, more efficient on your own. Second, as the auditor said, universal shared services authority. We should have better utilization of our assets, people, equipment, facilities, purchasing together, doing projects together where it makes sense, so section 9.482, I said I'd stay out of the weeds and here I go. Section, section 9.482 of the Ohio Revised Code gives every government entity in the state, taxpayer funded entity, because it's all the schools too, the opportunity to work with any other taxpayer funded entity to do things better, cheaper, faster. It's that easy. Wipe out the barriers, make it easier. The second thing we're really working on and we believe in is centralization at the county level. Let me explain it to you. If the neighboring school district, or in green, I said, the city and, and the school district work together and share a facility and share a number of programs together, if they're not good partners, we believe 88 counties, that the counties have the capacity to make infrastructure investments in technology and facilities and equipment and help guide that discussion for the local political subdivisions or on their behalf or at their request. We believe that capacity exists. But beyond that, if your neighbors don't want to work with you, and the county doesn't have the capacity to help make that happen or facilitate that, we have staked our ideas on, on another, another concept. Regional shared service centers. And I'll explain it to you quickly in a nutshell. Uh, currently, to provide support to education service providers in this state, there are 56 education service centers, the old county boards of education, 23 information technology centers, and a myriad of additional support network from the Department of Education and it's regionally provided around the state. House Bill 153, the recently passed budget, says that by July, 12, July 1st of 2012, next year, all of those entities will be integrated into a network of regional shared service centers. In addition, we changed the law that recognized that in many cases those ESCs or ITCs had already formed a council of government. We're already providing services to some of the smaller political ju jurisdictions. So instead we said let's make it statewide. Any of those ESCs, ITCs, or once they are integrated, regional shared service centers, can provide services directly to government or on behalf of government. And we hope those discussions are starting. Now when you leverage some of these things together, what happens is I've already heard from a large urban county that the ESC, who is looking at merging with a couple of other ESCs, is already in discussions with the county about which assets they can use. Who owns the technology? Who has the better software to leverage what we already have? We haven't even put the program in place yet. But it's happening, and people recognize it, but what we believe needs to happen is there need to be processes. Um, with all due respect to my friends at KnowledgeWorks, who I think have done some great work on finding efficiency in the school districts, we can't just say save money. We can't, what it's going to lead to is more cuts. We need processes. We need vehicles and mechanisms to allow people to collaborate and to understand what it is. So one of the things we've done or doing as part of that process of developing regional shared service centers is the first ever statewide survey of every political subdivision about shared services and the current state of shared services. So on October 14th, I thought we were going to send an email to 3,700 units. We talk about fragmented government. Auditor Yost referred to it. 3,700 units of, of government and schools in the state. By the time, I thought there were 88 counties. Everybody else think that? Well, there are 88 counties, but there are 17 independently elected officials, some of whom have their own shared service programs to make sure we captured everything. Oh, and then we have park districts, 
in water and sewer districts, in soil and solid waste districts. By the time we added up all public libraries, can make, do their own shared services, have their own autonomous decision making, can issue levies. By the time we totaled it up, 6,100 surveys went out around the state of Ohio. And I am happy to hear uh, my latest report, we are, we've already surpassed telemarketers and have a higher response rate than that, but we may not get 100% that the IRS gets. So somewhere in between, we are going to get the largest compilation of what's happening with shared services in the state of Ohio. And to give you an idea and something else I'll share with, with you and anyone else here today for your dissemination, when we talk about shared services, it is a broad concept that people are talking about around the state. So first, we have a definition of shared services that we hope everyone can start to agree to about what it means so that we're talking about the same thing. But in addition, we've categorized shared services into 10 main categories and 91 individual examples across technology and administration and public works and public safety and in school instructional support, on and on. 91 specific examples and then of course we have another category in each of those main 10. 91 examples of what shared service collaborations have been identified in the state and what we're trying to find out is where they're happening today, what's working, what have been the barriers and what do people want to do. We're going to take all of that data back in the plan that we're going to hand back to the governor and to the legislature by December 31st of this year for the creation of these regional shared service centers will take into account what people are doing today and what they want to do tomorrow and what laws and policies need to change and funding mechanisms need to change to allow that to happen. We do believe it's a very thoughtful process and I have really enjoyed getting to know the association leadership and individual members. I've met with individual local government leaders all around the state and the work of the associations has been great in sharing their thoughts and ideas as we work through this process. So that survey, that report and that plan we believe will be very exciting for everyone to follow and watch and not just because we've come up with it or that it's something that the Kasich administration can hang its hat on but because we developed it with the people who are going to live with it for years to come because it's the best of those ideas in understanding what they are trying to do and what we can do to help them and facilitate that. So, in a, I think as quickly as I could, that's what's going on. And it keeps me very, very busy. We're very excited for the work we're doing, the partnerships and collaboration we're developing. Uh, because in the end, that's where we are. This is a new budget reality that's not going anywhere. Some, some government, um, oh, two quick things. Uh, Auditor Yost mentioned David Osborne. This isn't easy. I can stand up here and say all these great things and how we're changing the law, but many of you have to live with it and you have the political realities and the resistance to change. I mean, I think everyone coming out of school should have to read Who Moved My Cheese? Um, and any of you who have read that, I came from the private sector. We had four reorganizations. I worked in five offices in six years when I was in the private sector. Change happens and there's a large portion of our culture that is used to that. Government, schools, other places, not so much. People got in expecting a 30-year career and they did not know they were going to have to deal with the level of change they are. David Osborne called collaboration, he once referred to it as an unnatural act between unconsenting participants. I chuckled when I heard that. <laughs> in any event, um, this isn't easy. It's difficult. It's very difficult and it's going to take time, but that's why we need wins. We need examples. Uh, Auditor Yost, Skinny Ohio is a great step. The auditor's office also maintains a shared services idea center that has hundreds of current examples of what's working and what's happening. We think that will be significantly updated through our work on the shared services survey and the release of those results and our work to develop a, a shared services model for the state and a plan for integrating all of those support networks to develop a network for schools and local governments um, to provide shared services in a regional capacity around the state. Thank you very much for your time today. And if you've gotten a survey or go back and ask to make sure somebody has filled out the survey, um, I've offered a Starbucks card to the association whose members have the highest uh, response rate. So there are some people you know, waiting for that high stakes prize. Thank you.
Thanks, Randy, and uh, really appreciate your time and the fact that you've got to get on to London, Ohio, uh, along with one of our panelists tonight, actually. Uh, but I, it's, it's important to note that uh, the information that they're seeking on the survey, uh, you should pay attention to back in your districts and jurisdictions. Uh, you can't make good decisions without good information. Uh, it's going to be very important to the success of, uh, of these initiatives that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, that we know what kind of cap public capacities are out there uh, to contemplate. Um, lest, lest we forget also, in uh, House Bill 153, there was a small provision for $45 million uh, innovation funds uh, that uh, folks should be pointing towards at this very time uh, in terms of planning and feasibility. You should mention something about that, Mr. Cole. <laughs> Sorry. I forgot about that part. There's a $45 million local government innovation program, a $45 million fund, the first funds of which will flow July 1st of next year. We've got a lot of work going on. Um, I have recently been designated uh, as a member of the 15-member local government innovation council. We are going to hold our first meeting in November. Uh, it also does include representatives from schools, local governments, uh, chambers of commerce, uh, foundations, philanthropy is represented on that council as well as uh, state legislators and members of the administration. Um, we're going to we're going to have our first meeting in November to develop the criteria. Uh, by the end of the year, we'll have all of that criteria announced, and um, subsequent to that, an application will go out to any political subdivision in the state. Early in the year, responses will come back March by March first. We'll evaluate the top projects in the state and make awards of grants and or loans, no interest loans, um, with a one-year grace period to be paid for out of savings. My voice just got ominous. Hugh? I'm talking about the money. No checkbook here today. The money will start to flow next year, but I do, I, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention the local government innovation program before, uh, but please be aware of that. And it is, it is meant to help plan and or implement um, quick to start, you know, with the RF funds they talked about shovel ready, with these they are implementation ready uh, programs around the state. It's a $100,000 cap per participant, $500,000 cap requiring a matching fund per project if it's a collaborative effort of five or more entities. Um, so you can go to the Department of Development website and again to Hugh and the uh, people here organizing a conference, I will get the contact information. It will be administered by the Department of Development. Thea Walsh is the program coordinator. I have her phone number and email address, so people stop calling me about this. I'm just one member of the council now, so thank you. standards uh, and the governance problems and, you know, challenges, I should say, that you face in standing up any kind of shared services approach uh, isn't, doesn't necessarily come cheaply. Uh, and the fact that, uh, that a piece of this, 80% um, of it is loan, I, I believe, and 20% are grants. Uh, and, and I'm frankly a big believer in uh, the loan aspect because I think what it does is it gives the legislature and the administration uh, the opportunity to create a continuous improvement fund because I think there's more than $45 million worth of, of planning and, and operational investment that needs to be made to get us to where we're ultimately going to be. Uh, but the fact that 80% of it will be in a loan, in the form of a loan, it's going to require discipline from participants, uh, a strong business case and, and discipline from participants on the back end in terms of repaying it, and it's in turn going to create all kinds of opportunity uh, ongoing uh, for future legislatures and administrations to, to fund continuous improvement in the state. So thank you, Randy, for your time today. Um, I really, really appreciate the perspectives of the administration. Uh, certainly, uh, we're all coming to grips with the fact that we have a 1950s uh, structure of both governments and schools, and, and oftentimes, and, and a new millennium revenue stream uh, that we have to adjust to. Um, at this time, I'd like our panel to join us. Uh, uh, we have three uh, innovators, uh, uh, Dr. Bart Anderson from the uh, Education Service Center of Central Ohio, uh, Dr. Barbara Gelman-Danley from the Rio Grande University and Rio Grande Community College, 
and Mr. John Whitehofer from the Miami Valley Communications Council. Would you all give him a round of applause, please? Um, folks on the stage today have uh, uh, understand the many challenges and opportunities of sharing services because they have developed and managed partnerships, public partnerships. Uh, our panel discussion will focus on three areas, eliminating the, the services, the service sharing capacities across the public spectrum, and that's important, not just service sharing within your discipline. Uh, prioritizing effective governance when constructing a shared service model, and sharing service, public service success stories and workflow experiences that our panelists have had while working on their own collaborative initiatives. I'll be moderating the discussion uh, and posing some questions to our panelists. Um, after some initial discussion, we'll open the floor to questions. Uh, and, and Jack has also agreed to, to be up here to field questions that you might have from his presentation or subsequent presentations. First, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Bart Anderson. Uh, Dr. Anderson has led the Educational Service Center of Central Ohio as a superintendent since 2004. Uh, at the ESC, he has expanded services into two adjacent counties and grown program revenues by 200%. Before joining the agency, Bart served uh, as a school superintendent in Ohio for 10 years, including the Port Clinton City School uh, District, which received Ohio's highest accountability rating. As you presume, Dr. Anderson is an educated man, having earned his doctorate from the University of Pennsylvania uh, and completed postgraduate studies at Miami University, Stanford University, uh, and it pains me to report the University of Michigan. Uh, please welcome Dr. Bart Anderson, uh, proud owner of the internet domain www.sharedservices.org. Oh, great. Great to see you. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, giving us some time today. This is my little perspective. What you can't see quite in the background is there's a rainbow actually appearing over that tornado. Um, it does have some appearance, uh, but it's a little better uh, with some out light. But the young man who put this together, when I told him I need the picture of the rainbow tornado, asked me if it was an LGBT pro wrestler. The truth is, no, this is a perspective, I think, of what a lot of people think is coming. Is it really a tornado or a rainbow in terms of what shared services can be? So why shared services? This is the short list we've kind of identified in, um, in the education space, which is really the only space I, um, I, I think we even have any experience to, to know or realize. But it's a system of finite resources. Um, and really what has historically been a focus that didn't need to be on productivity or, or um, um, a results-driven environment, but now more than ever is a resource optimization strategy. So for us in the education space, we realize these resources largely are human, but I'll, I'll show you a little methodology we're trying to utilize to think about also the non-human resources and how both volume and transaction costs can help us kind of analyze those units of local government service that are in education or outside education that are ripe for shared services. So what are the shared services is the quick uh, um, uh, summary. Obviously, it's a system of hybridization of traditional service delivery models. And all of these have been explored. The collaborative strategy is fundamentally about optimizing the people, the capital, the time, and the other resources. Here's the typology we started to think about from the standpoint of two by two matrix volume of the transactions and also transaction cost. So if you think about what really has terrifically high volume but low transaction cost, it's the processing of payroll. The amount of differential there is so tiny, but if you have an incredible volume of these transactions, there can be resources saved. It's the items that I think are particularly sexy are the ones that are both high volume and high transaction cost. Some of you might wonder, if you see a school bus going up the street, there's an empty seat on the school bus. What's the cost of an empty seat on a school bus? And I mean a three passenger seat. Um, that cost for a school year is about $2,000. Department of Education statistics tell you that an empty seat, a non-utilized seat on a school bus, when you go by and see one that's two thirds full, $2,000 per seat for an entire year. Um, other factors, we certainly recognize that there are factors around shared services about the competency, the visibility, the responsibility, and the authority of these various features. The ones that we want to speak a little bit about today are the, 
I want to point out of these high volume, high transaction opportunities. Transportation, interdistrict, an unknown consequence or an unanticipated consequence, I presume, of choice was increased transaction costs for transportation. If you think about the number of permutations, when I came to Franklin County in 2004, there were 16 school districts and 11 community schools. Today there are 72 community schools. So put that number of, in, in the 270 beltway, add an additional 60 permutations of community schools, obviously transportation costs are going to have some factor for what we call inter-district transportation. It's the school bus leaving the Olin Tangy local schools and dropping off at uh, the center of Columbus at perhaps the Metro Early College STEM High School. Special education, I point this one out because we recognize in providing the totality of needs of students, those on both ends of the bell curve are particularly difficult to serve in traditional settings and we think that there's obviously high volume, high transaction opportunities. That's where our specialization at the service center I think has, has shown some expertise. Clinical services, a special needs delivery service model. Uh, think about the most intense IEP or individualized education plan you can think of for a student. We have individuals we've identified that have 11 practitioners working on a single student's educational goals during the year. Could be a school nurse, occupational therapist, physical therapist, a visual or hearing interpreter, a mental health consultant, a school psychologist, and these individuals, um, special needs service delivery. In the state of Ohio, there are 6,900 licensed clinicians. Those 6,900 licensed clinicians, we hypothesize from our experience in Central Ohio, are all scheduled by hand. They're scheduled by hand because there's not a, an optimized system yet available. It's one we're proposing to try to build, but one that can move utilization and realization rates. Every 1% increase in realization rates for clinicians across Ohio, $5.9 million. So you're asking here, you're talking about 1% improvement in the realization and utilization of clinicians serving kids with IEPs, our most needy Ohioans, is a $5.9 million savings. Medicaid billing. Um, in our footprint of 25 districts, nine districts do not participate in the Medicaid school plan. They don't participate because the number of youngsters they have who are Medicaid eligible seem to be too low to quantify what can be the reimbursement costs that they would receive. We're suggesting a system that would allow Medicaid billing um, to be, again, improved in, in realization rates. The reason Medicaid billing should matter to the state of Ohio and local schools, because the state match is made by local taxpayers. It's not made by the state of Ohio. Medicaid billing has to be maximized in school districts. Again, 1% improvement there, a little over $6 million. ABCs of shared services, the very bottom is the most kind of important. Academic business and commodities, we see are the three primary lanes that shared services can focus on. Apply that back into the two by two matrix and just think about the expenses across local governments, in our case, local educational governments. And we think it's a model to think about where core competencies can be identified that are readily available and locally best uh, um, have high utilization and realization and where opportunities exist. A uh, real quick summary of ESCs in Ohio. There are 56, as I think Randy mentioned. 88 of those uh, originally as county boards of education formed in 1914. 1996 statute changed the service centers um, as the operational unit and expanded the missions to no longer be regulatory services but be educational shared services. Employ about 13,000 full and part-time employees across Ohio. In central Ohio, we employ um, um, a little over 1,100 of those individuals providing services to 25 school districts. Uh, ESC shared services, this is just a kind of a compendium of the menu list of services provided and from instructional and non-instructional focus. The, the unit that I lead here in Central Ohio, we want to recognize we have seven elected board members. If you wonder how ESCs are, are governed, they're governed by elected board members. Ed Bischoff, former OSBA um, president, is one of the elected board members that I serve here today. We serve Franklin, Delaware, and Union counties and um, um, have a budget of approximately $91 million local money. Um, Uncle John, our great governor, gives us a subsidy of about $2.5 million to provide regulatory services. Those are things such as licensing bus drivers, providing substitute teacher functions and attendance functions, but the vast majority in our case, um, over 95% is earned revenue and shared services. Substitute House Bill 153, also known as the budget, calls for, as, as uh, Randy Cole mentioned, integration of several of the shared service units. 
that moves the 56 ESCs, the ITCs, area media centers into a con, um, um, collaborative model, effective July 1, 2012. What the language, however, doesn't propose, that I think Jack uh, Grayson would, would uh, mention that we're trying to forward think about, is what the incentive or requirement could be for districts or local political subdivisions to enter into shared service agreements, and also what could be the potential policy levers to do so. The carrot and the stick are old, everybody understands those, but what could be the performance benchmarks established and also create various pressure systems where underperformance had been identified in those performance uh, uh, metrics that were established that um, Auditor Yost mentioned today and the performance audits that are occurring across Ohio. And then fi finally, a policy process. We've tried to identify, um, Jack, I think this, I, I'll have to call it the Grayson policy process, is a means by which we can establish a baseline of information or categories relative to the existing models and then identify areas for opportunity. Randy Cole and, and the Office of Budget Management is beginning a survey that we hope makes uh, um, an attempt for us to establish these baselines pressing forward, but then establish desired outcomes. And we're hopeful that can be done collaboratively across our districts, since they're really the ones that um, give us our marching orders, recognizing the existing infrastructure that's already in place, because ultimately what we want to do is try to optimize these resources. Um, optimizing those from the standpoint of physical assets as well as human assets. Thank you, Bart. And uh, I think you can see uh, the real potential there uh, in, in terms of uh, the customer focus uh, of the Central uh, Ohio ESC and, uh, and the reach, the broad geographical reach of ESCs throughout the state uh, gives us something to really start talking about in terms of recognizing broad public capacities uh, going forward. Um, so uh, with that, I want to uh, bring up Dr. Barbara Gelman Danley. Uh, she is, happens to be the president of the University of Rio Grande and Rio Grande Community College. Uh, she previously served as vice chancellor for academic affairs and systems integration uh, for the Ohio Board of Regents. Uh, in this role, uh, Dr. Gelman Danley was responsible for articulation and transfer within the University System of Ohio of a wide range of academic programs, access programs, tech prep, and workforce development. She previously served for nearly 10 years as president of Antioch University, located in Yellow Springs, Ohio, where it was last night. And Barbara has also served in the leadership position in academia and public broadcasting from New York to Oklahoma and has a distinguished track record in the area of shared services delivery. Uh, let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Barbara Gelman Danley, one of the few people of our age group that knows that SLA doesn't necessarily stand for Symbian Vietnamese Liberation Army. Uh, it stands for service level agreements. Dr. Danley. <laughs> you were going to mention I got my doctor from the University of Oklahoma. You feel bad in Ohio. I don't feel so good this week after our day. <laughs> it, it's great to be here, obviously, representing women and higher education. So I think it would be uh, uh, missing me not to say I've had a lot of experience for someone who's only 30 years old. I just want to point that out. <laughs> but I was at the Ohio Board of Regents. We did a lot, and uh, much of that has been maintained as far as leveraging across institutions. When Eric Fingerhut and uh, the governor set up through legislation the University System of Ohio, the entire plan was to get the institutions to talk amongst themselves, as they say on Saturday Night Live. And the supposition that that naturally happens, as many of our speakers have mentioned, is not necessarily true. We talked about efficiency versus politics. And what I, I, if I had one thing I've learned over the years, I've consulted at over 25 colleges and universities about strategic planning, technology, et cetera. People get in the way of these policies and processes. It is people who get in the way. It is not necessarily ideas. And if, as mentioned previously by Randy, when we get into higher education, uh, and I, I would dare say a lot of people who've been there a long time think that they should do things the way they did many years ago. In fact, I heard a speech once where a reference was given to a monk that was giving a lecture, and he was taken off for political reasons to prison, 
And 30 years later, he came back to the, his job. He took his notes, stacked them up, and said, as I was saying. So we certainly hope that's not going to continue to happen in higher education. On efficiencies of scales, we have to break down that sector divide. In higher education, that divide can be between community colleges, universities, et cetera. It isn't just uh, among the same sector. Some of the good things that happened uh, in the past are shared services for prescription drug purchases, which saved quite a bit of money. That began out of Ohio State. Shared textbooks. We're taking a look at shared technology services, et cetera. Uh, efficiencies of scales, I'm just that means next slide because you're, you're doing it right, I'm sorry. Um, I wanted to point out what I've learned from other places. And like I said, this goes from New York to California, all over the country, institutions that I've tried to help in higher education. And I would know they don't necessarily know the difference between a policy and a procedure. And so also in many cases in education, or I, will, I won't say K through 12, but higher ed, we don't have a policy or procedure or a process. So we can't even get to the process point because everything is in somebody's head who just left that job. And it's important to get things in writing. I learned that internal politics and strife cost a lot of money. Organizational structure or can help or damage. If you use the term business process reengineering at many institutions of higher education, there will be a sector of individuals who get that term and a much larger group that feels that that's somebody from business telling us what to do as opposed to somebody from education. There is a strong feeling in higher education that if the money belongs to the department, so you can take that and translate it to local governments, et cetera. Uh, when I lived in Dayton, when I lived in Rochester, New York, we used to say, who's responsible for economic development? And while everybody was arguing, was it the Chamber, was it the Dayton Development Coalition, whoever it was, NCR left and other companies left. So the idea is that we should not let the politics of who's in charge get in the way. I have a case study that's quite interesting. There was an institution I work with in another state, our controlling board president will be grateful for that, that had two networks on campus, two networks running the systems because the, the group that taught Microsoft certification wanted their own network, and the group that ran the administrative services wanted their own network, and the president put in a separate network, and I, a million dollars. And I was consulting for him then, and I said, are you crazy? I mean, tell them they don't get to access you know, they teach. They don't get to control. The, they don't have their own network. It doesn't work that way. Just shut the servers down for certain controls. The other case study, and they took it out, and it cost a lot more money to go to one network. Another case study is outsourcing. There are a lot of institutions in higher ed that learn uh, use outsourcing contracts for technology. They're okay. They may work. But it's not across the board like anything else, as was mentioned previously. Some of them are five-year contracts that require millions of dollars. And as with anything else, the team that originally came in to sell the process doesn't ever really show up or stay at the institution. And then you have a long-term commitment to that outsourcing. So there's no cure-all for one across the board. So I, I would just say that I've been to so many places that in summary in that part, in that slide, I would just like to say it's a mess in higher education as well. The intents are really good, but the stay, it's my property, not in my backyard, is, is just absolutely you know, dominant in higher ed. Let me talk about the University of Rio Grande and Rio Grande Community College. Briefly, in the 1800s, when private universities were being formed, a couple hundred years after Harvard, but most private universities, the University of Rio Grande was formed. And it offered courses and programs for the typical liberal arts kind of curriculum. Fast forward a hundred years when Governor Rhodes was setting up community colleges. And a group of individuals from the university spoke with the governor and said, look, we have a beautiful full service residential campus here. You do not need to build another community, another community college. You're building all these community colleges. Use this campus. And a very interesting arrangement was set up. The accreditation, the faculty, most of the facilities work that's being done is managed by the university. 
There are two boards, though, to protect the state dollars, and there are nine employees on the community college side. It is considered a full and equal partner to all other community colleges, but they didn't have to go out and hire a whole bunch of people to manage it. The arrangement was, if you do that, University of Rio Grande, then you have got to allow every student coming in from the state of Ohio to be classified as an Ohio community college student the first 64 hours. Look at the tu tuition differential. They pay the community college rate for the first 64 hours, and those who choose to stay and go on pay the private university rate, which is about $9,000 less than some of the higher private university rates. Trade for that is capital dollars for technology and facilities are allowed to go into the university from the state. Now, a perfect example, if you don't know where Rio Grande is, does anybody know what down on the farm restaurant started there? Think mashed potatoes, sausage, all those things that would not, would need, you'd have to work out more. Bob Evans. Now, Bob Evans Farms is a perfect example of a wonderful relationship with the university. One example is the state put in money toward uh, the m uh, most recent building, and Bob Evans, through a fundraising campaign, donated the rest. So you have, look at the leveraging that took place there. It wasn't a matter of fighting. It wasn't a matter of asking the state for the additional million dollars. And it wasn't not having the building because you couldn't afford it. All about leveraging. There's an off-campus site in one of the four counties. The counties are Meggs, Jackson, Vinton, and Gallia. Capital dollars have gone into that from the Community Improvement Corporation. They own the building. The building is leased, and the land is owned by the local schools, Meggs Local. Nobody fought over it. They just said, we don't have enough money. We're in Appalachia. We have to find ways to work together. And there are service level agreements for all of these kinds of arrangements. The, I, will, I point out a few things from our strategic plan that we recently did, a 10-year strategic plan. Big focus, financial stability. It is very difficult to keep up with these times for any of us. So we took a look at the tuition for the community college, the tuition for the university, fundraising, balancing the budget, and having flexibility. And all of this was done with two institutions, two boards. I've actually had governing associations say, God bless you, Barbara, you answer to two boards. But I will tell you, they are fantastic. And we do joint retreats, and we work well together, and yet the money is kept separately. Now, if it were today, and they were two separate institutions, and somebody came in and said, you have to do this, it wouldn't work well. So it wasn't mandated. It was arranged, and it works very well. There was a time when the institution went to two separate presidents, from 2003 till 2009. And that created a slight civil war. You cannot have two presidents at the same place. But somehow you can have two, forgive me, superintendents, two presidents, a head of a career school in each other's backyard. And it causes some issues. When I was a vice chancellor, and I will not name the community, we were at a place where we were sitting at a community college that had an arrangement with one of the universities. They didn't talk to each other. There was a fight over whose logo goes on the van. Now, can you imagine trying to share dollars when that happens? And there was a career school you could see out of the window that wasn't talking to them. So under those circumstances, again, it is people who get in the way. Absolutely, processes and policies are critical. But until we think beyond the people holding the current positions and we take look at things a little differently, it's going to be hard to move on. The next and, of course, most important part in education, student success. And when we looked at I just want to talk about briefly degree completion, certificates to degrees, et cetera, our articulation and transfer is built right in. We don't have to have a problem with each other. Two-thirds of our students are commuter students. One-third uh, live in the dorms. We're going to have more live in the dorms over time. But this is, uh, like I said, a very impoverished area, and people are afraid to leave home. If you are, any of you from the Appalachian region, they're not comfortable outside their own area. So scalable ideas, shared services. 
it isn't enough that we already have this pretty unique arrangement. In fact, totally unique, the only one in the country. We recently had a key personnel uh, vacancy, and we made an arrangement with another community college for $3,000 a month to help give us advice so our people could manage that position. I don't, I don't see how you could get anything better. And my guess is it may last a long time. We just started that. Joint purchasing is an area where you can save, of course, a great deal of money. In the consulting I've done, I have found that administrative and academic technology people don't always talk to each other. And I, I was a CIO at a large community college, and I believe in the model that a computer is a computer is a computer. But in lots of institutions, and I got plenty of teachers and principals and all that in my family, it's segregated. And it just ends up being a lot more expensive. I do believe you need policies and procedures in place. I'm very much an advocate for policies, procedures, and processes to be in place. Appropriate governance and oversight, letting go of internal silos, and focus on one thing. There was a time when I was consulting prior to being president with Rio Grande, and there was a little fussiness between the two boards, and we were in a room that had a glass window surrounding it. And I had a lot of authority as a consultant con in the role I had. And I said to them, well, I'd like to stop this meeting and to have you all pretend that 2,200 noses were pressed against that window. Now, please continue and tell me if you would communicate the same way. Think about the students. Think about your customers. Scalable ideas. I'd like to point out that I believe, and so do many national uh, associations, that Rio can be a model. What grew from politics and circumstances turned out to be the shared services model of 2011. It's, it's right on target, and we didn't have to go there. We're already there. The systems in place have to outweigh and outlast the people in place. So whatever you do, have it be more long term. Governance and oversight is absolutely critical. Letting go of internal silos. And finally, focus on the stakeholders. Again, as I said, think about the students. So I have seen a lot of waste as our first speaker so well pointed out, waste upon waste upon waste. I've been called into institutions where they paid a large accounting firm $250,000 to analyze their technology. They didn't understand higher ed, and for uh, like $6,000, I would go in and spend a day or two with them and try to translate it. Waste. Just because it's a well-known name doesn't mean it has the answer. So we're excited uh, to be here today to work with the administration on new ways to change things. And again, we are the only institution like this in the country, so glad to answer any questions about it when the time comes. Thank you. Well, you can see why she was part of the program. Uh, Rio Grande uh, University and the Rio Grande Community College are something we can all be proud of, um, especially uh, Dr. Gilman Danley. Um, it, it's very instructive in terms of, of how we move forward and, and move past some of, um, some of the natural challenges uh, that we face in a shared services environment. And, uh, and look just for uh, the public capacities that can be leveraged for the benefit of the stakeholders. Now our next, um, our next panelist, uh, someone I know very well from my days over in Dayton, Ohio, John uh, Whitehofer, uh, was a former city manager from that area in Miamisburg. Uh, and how John and I got to know each other was we, uh, uh, we locked arms and decided to go to Washington and have a little dialogue uh, with the Department of Energy over uh, what's known as payment in lieu of taxes for a uh, facility that built nuclear trigger devices uh, for the Manhattan Project. Uh, and it took um, you know, probably, I can't remember how many acres, was it 400 acres out of, uh, 400 acres out of tax production, um, and uh, we thought that the schools needed uh, to be compensated as other communities were across the country, and so that's how I got to know John. Uh, he's now the Executive Director of the Miami Valley Communications Council since 2008. Uh, the council is a municipal service and technology organization uh, representing eight member cities in Montgomery and Warren County. Uh, Mr. Whitehofer uh, served 18 years as the city manager of Miamisburg, Ohio, as one of the uh, top growth cities in the region and state during, the, during his tenure there. Uh, John handled challenging issues in, in his role of transitioning of a federal research facility 
uh, to their local community improvement corporation, the great train derailment evacuation, some might remember in Minesburg, Ohio, and uh, revitalization of their historic downtown. Uh, John has been recognized uh, by his colleagues as Public Manager of the Year in the Miami Valley and is with us today to talk about his initiatives to leverage collaborative strengths uh, and the uncommon opportunities uh, we have today to deliver common services more efficiently. So uh, please join me in welcoming uh, my friend, Mr. John Whitehofer. Good afternoon. We're going to move from uh, education to local government, and I'm going to give you just a view from the local level as to some cooperative projects that we are working on, and um, just give you some history real quick. The uh, Miami Valley Communications Council was established back in the mid-1970s, and the concept was proposed by Karen Mayor Horn, and it really involved the original television and cable franchise agreements that each municipality let at that point in time. Uh, Senator Peggy Lehner, that's in the room, was a council member in the city of Kettering. Uh, before her state office, I know she was actively involved with the uh, Communications Council. It is a council of governments, a local government. It does have eight member cities and then 20 affiliate members in, in Montgomery, Miami, and Greene counties. It is funded by the 5% franchise fee on cable bills for the use of the public right-of-way for the cable system, so that is the uh, source of uh, funding. What I'm going to do is go through the, the uh, well, an innovative approach of the eight cities was to use the cable franchise fees as a platform to do three service or product lines for the eight core member cities. First was public information. Uh, the Communications Council operates four government education community access channels that produce over 24,000 hours of local television programming that goes from community events to, to your school board meetings, council, planning commissions, and so forth. NVCC is the Ohio leader in quality government, educational, and public access television, having received 140 national or state awards for community television and production. The second product line, which is very, very uh, unique, is public safety. Uh, NVCC supports and funds a tactical crime suppression unit which is a regional criminal investigation unit for the eight cities that cooperate on regional investigations and the sharing of personnel, equipment, and training resources. TCSU also operates under the Ohio Attorney General's Office, the Ohio Organized Crime Investigation Commission Task Force, both a, a federal, state, local task force for the Dayton region. And that particular task force was recognized with the 2008 Presidential Council on Integrity and Efficiency Award given by the uh, U.S. government. Uh, this particular task force leads the state of Ohio in arrest, taking 227 career criminals off the streets in the state of Ohio over the last five years. And then the third product service area is regional cooperative projects, municipal services. And that can range uh, anywhere from a street lighting contract for 17 cities that saved about $2.5 million for those communities, electric generation supply agreement, a uh, $25 million agreement that saved $2.3 million over 22 months, natural gas supply agreements, a code red emergency notification system, and a municipal training academy that uh, we operate that provides training to 70 local governments in southwest Ohio, from the city of Cincinnati on the Ohio River to uh, the city of Piqua in the northern part of Miami County. And we train over 1,265 municipal employees per year in 175 classes that can range anywhere from supervision, all the comprehensive safety training, computer technology, and management skills training for all of the uh, 70 cities in their workforce. One thing that we're doing currently, uh, back in May, uh, we hosted a 
meeting of 26 city managers to talk about future municipal cooperative projects. And from that discussion, we are now focused well on four project areas. The first is health insurance, a consortium for the cities, the 26 cities on the uh, health insurance contract or self-funding. Uh, waste collection and recycling across 15 cities. Computer system support program where all the servers and the support for all the um, computer systems in those cities will be centralized. And then building inspection and code enforcement, centralizing that service across all the cities. So really in, in the third function, municipal services, we are really now focused on those four core areas as being the candidates for significant consolidation, sharing of services, and then savings to uh, the cities that participate in those programs. What I like to do, and it's a very innovative program in the state of Ohio and nationally, I like to focus real quick on the tactical su suppression uh, unit. It was formed in the mid-1970s, and its motto is Safer Communities for Crimes Beyond Borders. And what this unit does, it really operates for the eight member cities, a cooperative police investigation unit designed to deal effectively with criminal activity of mutual concern. And the basic function would be joint criminal investigations, training for all uniform officers, a SWAT team or a special response team that is regional, a mobile command post and emergency management operations services for the eight cities, tactical equipment and surveillance equipment, uh, firearm simulation training. We have a computerized firearms training on the use of force that uh, goes into each city every, uh, every year. We do extensive crime analysis across our eight cities, and we operate, as I mentioned, the Ohio Organized Crime Investigation Task Force for the Dayton region. What TCSE provides to the eight cities, it allows any police officer in any of our eight departments jurisdictional authority in any TCS city by requesting a sanctioned investigation by TCSU. So any officer would have full arrest authority in the eight cities. It provides 40 detectives and nine command personnel for criminal investigations. It provides four polygraph operators to the member departments for either pre-employment or criminal investigations. And then it uh, gives each city access to a surveillance and technical, technical team that puts specialists into the field on surveillance, evidence technicians, or traffic crash investigations for those departments. Where we're moving on TCSU as we look at criminal investigations and budgets and manpower is intelligent mode policing. And we're doing this through our website, database, crime mapping, and crime analysis. So if you're a detective in a department in the city of Kettering, you can access any police report in the eight cities, any criminal investigation file, any field interrogation card, any traffic stop. And you can search those databases. If you have a crime involving a white Chevy pickup truck, you can search the database and identify crimes that have occurred with a vehicle of that nature. It also, uh, on the crime analysis side, we track crime across every area. And we have software capability where we can predict on an 80% probability when the next crime will occur, both physically by location and by time of day. And what we do, and, and this mainly will be on burglaries and bank robberies or crimes of that nature, is once we get the data and we look at the location and the time of day, we flood that zone with criminal investigators. And nine out of 10 times, the crime occurs specifically in that geographic location, which normally is that eight block physical area. And we have a, <clears throat> a four hour window of occurrence. And nine out of 10 times, the crime will occur in that window, in that geographic area, and arrests are made you know, as the crime occurs. So we are deploying our criminal investigators 
and field patrol units solely based on crime analysis and crime data as far as what we're seeing uh, within each of the eight, uh, eight cities. In summary, uh, the Tactical Crime Suppression Unit is really uh, a national model on organized crime investigation units and providing police services, investigations, training, and special response teams. And it's been a very successful, effective unit for our eight cities. It's something that um, we take a lot of pride in. It's a very aggressive approach as we deal with crime uh, within the region. As you know, crime does not respect boundaries of the eight cities. It does not stop at the city limit. And by taking this approach, I think we are very successful in deploying our resources intelligently based on data and good investigation to get the maximum return on the investment that we have in each of our officers. And with that, uh, I'll turn it back to you. Well, you can see also, as a member of the panel, uh, you know, the procurement deals are, are particularly instructive. Uh, he went outside of his eight member communities, uh, and he built a 2022 community coalition uh, uh, to get out into the marketplace and leverage uh, a better margin uh, uh, based on the volumes they could all put together. Did it on natural gas, they did it on street lighting and electricity. Uh, those kind of opportunities are, are out there. And also, from the flavor of John's remarks, you can see, you know, what a focus. Uh, and for those that are strictly education folks, education community here, uh, if you're talking to local governments, you're going to have to talk to them about public safety costs. Uh, that's where uh, the rubber meets the road in terms of finding some economies and figuring out, uh, you know, shared services approaches like central dispatch or regional dispatch. Uh, you know, those type of things, uh, call center approaches to, uh, uh, for these local governments that have to bear such a heavy burden on, uh, on investigating crimes and incarceration, it, it, it's a huge deal at the local government level. So I guess with that, we're going to uh, take it to the next level on, uh, on the panel and open it up for some questions. Um, I'm happy to moderate and take questions from the floor. There's a microphone <coughs> set up in the center. And any questions that you might have regarding um, uh, any of the presentations that have been presented, we're happy to field and direct them appropriately. Uh, would you please state your name? <laughs> yeah, really, the staffing for the TCSU unit, each officer comes from their member departments, so the eight departments supply officers into the uh, criminal investigation unit. Those eight officers are covered by their individual departments for all their pay, benefits, collective bargaining, contracts, policies, and procedures. So they, we really, as a TCSU unit, we do not negotiate contracts with our officers. We do not control their uh, pay or benefits. Any liability insurance coverage remains with the member department. And that structure really keeps us at NBCC out of that whole collective bargaining arena. And it, it, it really keeps that officer under the control of their department for collective bargaining. And that's how uh, it's been structured for, for uh, TCSU. Yes, sir. In the 
case of the Communications Council, the hard service procurement contracts are very easy to scope savings. So if you took the electric supply agreement, we knew specifically what those entities were being billed and paid and what they paid for their particular uh, facilities and buildings. And when we negotiated the new contract, it was a very simple analysis to you know, come up with the $2.5 million in savings. The Municipal Training Academy is a tougher nut to put savings dollars on because, in essence, by taking the 70 cities into a training academy, it took the burden off each HR department in those 70 cities to do all their own OSHA safety training, supervisory development training, you know, police patrol investigation training, those type of activities. So we, we really do not try to put a savings on the MTA. The, the, the catalyst to that initiative was mainly to improve the level of training, the proficiency, the skill levels, and to do it jointly because no one had the uh, individual capability. Anyone else on the panel would like to speak to that? We backed into ours, so it's hard to say what the prediction was, but had they set up which they were intending to a community college in that area, would have had all the duplicative costs. So it, it, it would probably be $25 million just to get it going on the average over time, and then all the personnel that are being managed by sharing. So it was a lot. Well, I think it walks back also to discipline. Um, in a shared services environment, there's a presumption that there's a shrinkage, and sometimes it's FTEs. And, it's, and it has been said many times here tonight, you know, this is not easy. This is tough stuff. Uh, and in order to make a business case on a shared services model, there's going to be shrinkage somewhere. Uh, so I think it maps back to the discipline of the partners uh, and the accountability of the partners on uh, who put together that business case and how did you get there. You know, and if you're taking a, a treasurer and making him a janitor uh, because he's part of a family and, you know, these are, these are tough decisions to make, uh, you know, and there's no savings there, well, then there goes your business case. So it maps back to the discipline associated, I think, with some of the shrinkage that I think you're naturally going to see in a shared services environment, at least in the decentralized environment. Hi, my name's Carrie Brown. I was wondering, um, for all of the panel members, each of you talked a little bit about the importance of internal and external stakeholders and the buy-in of people in these sorts of plans. Talk to me a little bit about the communication strategies you put in place as you were developing shared services and other kinds of collaborations. We'll start off with Dr. Anderson here. Sure. Uh, so we actually do direct customer relationship outreach to our school district clients. Uh, quite frankly, I've been a school superintendent 17 years, but I have some retired colleagues who are significantly more um, um, experience in this field and that communication starts with the board level, superintendent level, but don't forget we have to acknowledge the, the work of labor because so much of this involves uh, a labor force. In, in our case, it starts early obviously with those schools or individuals. Presently, we're doing customer relationship management with our local government. Um, and, and likewise, these are elected officials who can toggle election to election. So I, I, um, I don't know how to acknowledge a ready pathway for your answer, but other than to say we recognize the critical nature of working with elected officials as well as um, appointed executives. Uh, Dr. Daniel. I think the best example I can give is when we did our strategic plan, which would address all of these things. We, uh, we served four counties. We had meetings in all four counties. We published them in the newspapers. We invited uh, folks by discipline. Uh, my, my terminal degree is, it sounds deadly, literally, but my, my PhD is in communication, so uh, I was pleased that when I came in it was going on, but there's always ways to improve it. So we have major input. and. Ironically, I would say it, top, it starts at the top, and that's not me, that's trustees, but it has to be owned here, because if it isn't owned here, it won't work. So my communications life is very simple, and I thank God for it every day, because I, I deal with a communications council, so I have 10 council members, so I can, vet, I can communicate into their city organization as to priorities very quickly. 
I meet monthly with all the city managers, so that's my communications hub as to what they're doing operationally. And I meet monthly with all the police chiefs. And then the, the fourth group is all my HR people. So my, my structure is deliberately set up on monthly meetings with my core groups. And the elected officials are the communications council. And then the city operational folks, be it city managers, chiefs, HR directors, or even public works officials, I'm meeting with monthly. And they're the ones that feed back into me and what are the issues in the field, what are they doing operationally, what are the process issues, contract issues that they want help with. And once they feed those into me, then I just take ownership of running you know, those to ground. And then if it impacts their particular city, then they're responsible on their own to communicate within their structure. So it's a very simple process, and uh, it works very well. Follow up? May I ask a second question? You may. Um, for Dr. Grayson, maybe particularly, thinking about the all-sector comments that you made, um, we hear a lot about how the private sector has lessons to learn for the public sector. In your work, have you seen certain concepts such as organizational citizenship or other kinds of concepts that the private sector is learning from the public sector? The private sector is, in general, ahead of the education sector. If you were in contrast education, I, when I came, I thought most of the conversations were education, but I'm pleased to see it's all governmental, mostly. The private sector is ahead in a lot of these things. And a lot of people are still in the industrial age and haven't yet learned from some of the mistakes that were made in the private sector, as well as the things they have discovered. So I wouldn't say you can be classified as ahead or behind. You get misconceptions every time. Most people don't think the military should be consulted. They have an awful lot to share. I haven't heard health care mentioned. You've got some of the best clinics in, the, in this nation here that you can learn from, and they can learn from the public sector. I hear words like shared services and benchmarking and functional silo destruction, all of which are encouraging. I don't put down any one sector as being leading totally, but I do think it's neglected that you have one of the, to look for the best practices that come from the private sector. I think from what I've heard, Ohio has a chance to take a little national leadership as a state. And I can tell you, in some states, they want to do this, but they don't have many of the things I've heard today. We, we have four tools of improvement. Every organization in this place is organized to get the results you're now getting. So, would you like to change? And I guess the simplistic answer is, I dare you to go back and write down and draw your process maps of what you're now doing, doing what I did with that teacher. I go to work. I organize the probabilities that they're going to do crimes in certain areas. I have higher education, the supply chain that you talked about that's missing. So each one of you can contribute a lot in the shared services. It's extremely difficult to do in the private sector, too. But all of you can do, the process is the slab. If you remember the slab I put up there, then including everything that you're doing, and you are doing a lot, that's why I wanted to come here, is because I know you can. It isn't private, it's private. You, the coordination, the communities of practice that you could organize. There's tremendous opportunities, but it all starts back with me if you want to improve don't just have accountability, but work on improvement. And I'm encouraged by what I heard today here in Ohio. Okay, I have a question. Um, how, how should governance be contemplated uh, in an environment that serves both uh, local governments and schools? So anybody wants to take a shot at that? I mean, it's a... Yeah. Think of the word customer. Put the customer into everything you do. I think students are customers. I think the people who clean the toilets are customers. I think school boards are customers. 
I think more of the councillors are customers. I would put the chancellors as customers. And if you think that way, then it will change your perspective. And I would include them. Don't let them stay outside and say, good luck with what I've just ordered you to do. <laughs> but bring them in and have them sit down and join in the process building. I know that's a simplistic answer. Hard to do, change management, barriers. But if you think customer, it makes a difference. Yes. The, the government structure in, in the public sector is critical because anytime you expend public monies or have public services, there has to be accountability. And, and, and the key, at least in our case, um, you know, if it's a tactical crime suppression unit, the governance of that unit is the eight police chiefs, and they have the legal authority to operate that unit. And they ultimately all have a say in how it's managed and operated. The policies, anything from use of force through operational, they all review and approve so that there is a very com strong comfort level that if they have an issue in operations on the street as a chief, they have a vehicle to address that issue with the, the chiefs, the eight chiefs that meet, you know, they're the board of directors of the TCSU unit, and ultimately under the legal agreements approved by each city council, they have operational authority. And that, that's a key structure, and it, it has to be in place ultimately in the public sector because of the public money, public employees, public service, that you have to have somebody that ultimately has legal authority. Well, if I can be candid and use a little humor, when I was a consultant, for the university and the community college. I insisted we have a joint retreat of both boards. They had never done that, okay? So they never brought away overnight somewhere. And we went to Chillicothe. Anybody ever been to Chillicothe? That's big compared to why I was up there. <laughs> and at midnight, we went to Roosters. Anybody know what Roosters is? Okay. And I suggested, and I learned this from my friends at the Dayton Development Coalition, they're not there, some of them anymore, but wild turkey shots, okay? And I challenged them to do wild turkey shots at 12 o'clock. Now, I didn't do that because I wanted to get sick. I did that because I wanted them to see themselves outside the normal governance, which was uh, an opposition. They weren't going to do it, and I said, I thought all bubbles were real men, and I've never heard waitress come out of somebody's mouth faster. So I challenged the guys to do that. They did, and they passed a Let's Work Together resolution the next day. Now, that's very transparent, but the point is, in governance, that you get the right people in a room and you create an atmosphere where they will get outside of their normal behavior and start talking to each other. And they did, and that's become a yearly tradition, doing those joint retreats. I always, you know, I'm not on the panel, I'm not one of the smart, smart ones, but um, I found that governance is really important because you need to use the governance structure that you can agree upon, you know, to respect all of the partners at the table and give them uh, ownership over whatever process you're trying to re-engineer. Really important. And, and really, there's a process that's gone on over in Dayton. I don't. I actually talked to Commissioner Foley about this and told him I was going to stick a sharp stick in his eye over it. But if, if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit about the regional dispatch that they stood up, uh, kind of the standing right now where they are with that business case and kind of where they're moving forward on that, or it would be helpful, I think, in the, the, the regional county, regional dispatch in Montgomery County was stood up about uh, three years ago. Yeah, three. And it covers about 70% of the population of the county. And um, it, it has been successful. And the issues that they're facing currently, it's operated by the Montgomery County Sheriff's Department. Uh, but the issue goes back to governance. And uh, it, it's an issue that's now on the plate at the county level because there's an advisory council to the sheriff but as issues percolate out of the dispatch operation from each city, there really has not been an effective way for the chiefs of each department to get those issues addressed 
at the regional dispatch operation. So back to your comment on governance, I think that's one lesson that we're learning with the regional dispatch operation in Montgomery County is that you do have to have an effective governance structure that allows the member agencies input into the operations and the management of that service and ultimately to be able to impact it if there is a mistake in dispatch or some operational issue that gets the issue addressed and the member is satisfied with what, and what occurs. But a lot of the governance has become the big issue mm -hmm. on regional right. dispatch in the government can And they've got a plan to go forward, I think, now. They, they are. To fix it, because they're actually underwater on their business case uh, because of how it was stood up. Um, the, the county sheriff jumped in and said, mine, mine, mine. And when the, when the big player does that in a shared services type of initiative, you know, everybody's heading for the doors. And so what happened was they were left with a core of communities uh, for this service where they could make a business case, but they were really overbuilt for the number of communities that ended up in the program. So they're underwater. So now they have to figure it out through governance. They have to go back and, and, and take a look through the Council of Governance, mm -hmm. governance uh, in Montgomery County. If they can structure something that will draw all the communities in uh, to save the business case, otherwise Montgomery County is going to have to pony up and, and cover uh, the margin. So. Yeah, governance is really important in these processes and discipline. Mm -hmm. Questions? We're getting close. Um, Dr. Danley, uh, can you talk a little bit about service level agreements and kind yes, of the, 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 the importance of uh, service level agreements, mm -hmm. uh, not the SLA of the Symbionese Liberation okay. Army? But. Well, I learned this term when I went back to school online and took, I was put over um, academic and administrative technology under one CIO position at a large community college in New York. And naturally, some of the folks said, well, you come from the academic side, you're not going to get this, whatever. My response, and this is an ad for higher ed, is so go back and get some education on it. And I, I went to NYU and took an advanced professional certificate online in information technology. All that being said, it was about security and how to manage, how to manage systems, et cetera. And there was a big push for service level agreements, which is to say, Let's take technology and the end users who are always saying it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And then, by the way, they don't go to the training. And does anybody know what percent the work of a technology department goes up when someone doesn't get training? 20%. 20% more work comes out of the tech people if teachers or faculty or public employees, government employees don't go to training. So the whole idea is that you write an actual service level agreement that says this is what you will do for this department, this is what we will do for this department, and we're going to work together. And we do have that under a different title for the university and the community college. I think it's get it in writing. It's kind of like prevent the divorce before it happens. Get it in writing. It doesn't always help, but yeah. you know. And it does, though. I mean, because it articulates what expectations are on the right. performance of the system, on the training aspect. Uh, it does what? At the state, at the state you know, the, the training uh, issue was huge because we launched an, an, a brand new integrated information system on day one of the administration. And the training, uh, oh my goodness, uh, it was something we dealt with. It was, it was probably the most well-kept secret success story of the administration, to be honest. But, People got paid and, and we got through it. But uh, uh, service level agreements are something that uh, are, are really going to make uh, a shared services initiative uh, uh, successful, I mean, not in and of themselves, but the articulation and the process that you use uh, to get to an understanding on expectations uh, really took you for, for way down the road uh, in terms of success on these things. Yes, sir. Costs and, and, and 
share. And uh, one thing I've not heard is leadership and how you get people to get out of their silos, to see the big picture, to see where the future is, to get out of their comfort zone, to sit down at a table and say, okay, whatever my political affiliation is, whatever my feelings are on a given subject, how do we sit down and have a, a cogent discussion to come up with something positive so we can move this thing ahead? Because that's the thing we've been back and back and forth. We've been hearing this for a long time. It seems like it's reached critical mass, but there's certainly a lot of people that are going to have to change their ideas about what's needed to be able to make this happen. Could you comment on that? Sure. Yeah. I had this problem when I first went to business and tried to get them to change back 30, 20, 30 years ago. And everybody said, no, we can't, there's no way we can change what we're doing. So I had them benchmark, meaning go to a place that does it. I took CEOs to Japan. They couldn't believe that Toyota and Nissan and the others were making anything. They couldn't do that. They went over there and came back scared to death because they saw others working. So take it away from the Japanese and make it back local. If you find somebody that's a real skeptic, I say, well, why don't you go look here and see where it works? Oh, no, it can't work that way. We have never found anybody who didn't go and learn from somebody else and come back a believer. That's the strongest way, I think, to rather than talk to them, give them printed materials on leadership, I think you go to I'm I Googled in uh, leadership, and I got 22 million responses. I, I don't mean from people, I mean hits. Leadership, I believe, comes from empowering people to learn. And learning from others who have done it is one of the best ways to go about overcoming cynicism. Rather than coming from me. So I have take people to places where it's working, and let them see for themselves, it works. That isn't a cure, but it sure is a scholar to overcome resistance. Doctor? I'll give a quick answer because I know in, in teachers taking time to travel and all that kind of, it's money, it's time, it's, it's pay me, which always frustrates me, but when we do strategic planning, and this is something that I've enjoyed doing with other places, is strategic planning, you have them do homework. What are the national trends? What are the state trends? What are the local trends? But a lot of strategic plans fall short because they jump right to recommendations. I stop the conversation and would recommend you do that at that point, to have discussions about so what, what does it mean for your district, your ESC, whatever. Because in that case, if you cannot physically go somewhere, you've at least found out that you're not working in isolation, what other places do. And it's really quite the aha moment. And then you get to recommendations. And it, it, oftentimes, I've been at higher ed institutions which would be very resistant to change. But when they've done that homework, and I suggest sometimes they do the homework outside their own discipline. So the school of that does what's going on in education, but I also think it's a good idea for them to find out what's going on in management and vice versa. And, and just pause to have the implications discussion. If you can travel, I, I, I would never want to even think you need validation. I think you're fantastic. But I agree with that idea. If you could go see something, it's kind of like that consultant that's from 200 miles away. But they could research it as well. I had to do that. Video conferencing, because you can't afford to travel. Video conferencing is rising fast as a way to share across the globe. We have a video conferencing system. I can talk to anybody in Singapore, Finland, Mexico, Iwana, and they can share with one another when the travel costs are prohibited. And it's face-to-face. -face. I'm talking Skype is the one if you can't afford high bandwidth. Get on Skype and have communities formed where people can learn from one another. One last, I have to do one last PS. People ask me all the time, what's the 21st century skills that are going to be needed to be leaders here? I said, the best thing I have, and I've been a dean of two, several schools, professor, learning how to learn. If that, you can do that, 
you'll be safe no matter what the environment is because you learn from the environment. So learn how to learn, and you learn that by talking to others. And one last comment to your point about you know what's changed. You know we're we're collaborating uh, on on some commodities at the EPCs and whatnot. Yeah, that's that's going on. But what's changed is uh, is a revenue model and revenue stream uh, that none of us have known before. Uh, I navigated through four years of it at the state level where, you know, I was banging vendors for 15% on their contracts and never, you know, no, no pay raises and cost savings days being negotiated. It was unrelenting. Um, and, and what you're facing, especially in the education space right now, is not only an administration that's turning the valve, now, they're giving some incentives in some areas, too, to improve, but they're turning the valve. But there's another group turning the valve, and it's the local voters who have just hit a wall. Uh, and there's just not enough uh, local tax money to support. It's not that they don't love their schools, uh, own their schools, uh, uh, and, and love their communities, uh, but they just don't have it. Uh, the economy has taken its turn on them. So uh, that's going to make leaders uh, change, uh, it's going to change leaders, uh, uh, or they're going to get committed to change management. If I could add one comment, the, the, the key that was made, change, it's painful in local government, public sector, school districts to change and consolidate services, and you truly have to go and benchmark and go and see what's been done right, and that's the key. When the chiefs, when I took eight chiefs to the city of Chicago Police Department to look at crime analysis and deploying the patrol and detective divisions based on crime analysis and predictability, once they saw it and they saw how they were doing business back home and they were out of their zone, they got it. They, they saw it, they saw it work, they got it, and they went back home and said, do it. And I think that's the key if we're going to change how you're doing business and consolidate a service or change how it's provided. Well, I want to thank you, and I want to bring up uh, Mr. Terry Ryan still here. <laughs> I'd like to bring up Terry to close us out. I know we're running about six or seven minutes late, and I apologize for that, but I hope uh, you found it worthwhile. <laughs>